Okay, let's get started. Welcome back, students, to Dante's The Divine Comedy 2019-2020 Lecture 36. Introductory lecture on Dante's Paradiso, Canto 22 to 27, though probably only to 25 today. The Sphere of the Fixed Stars, Part 1, slides 237 to 276. Let's go back quickly. Let's see Dante enter the fixed stars. Never on earth, where movements up and down occur naturally, was ever movement so rapid that it could be compared with my flight. So it's moving in a supernatural at a supernatural speed here. As I hope, reader, direct address, to return to that devout triumph on account of which I often weep for my sins and beat my breast, you would not put your finger in a flame and ah, draw it out again more speedily than I saw the sign after Taurus, Gemini, his sign, and found myself there. O glorious stars, O light, which is filled with immense power, from which I acknowledge all my genius, that is the uh, astrological sign Gemini. He believed that since he was born under the sign of Gemini, that he was given great intellectual and create, creative abilities. Sort of like you can still see written in astrology books that you can still buy from bookstores like Barnes & Noble on Valley Parkway. Um, rising with you and hiding myself with you was he who is father of every mortal life, uh, uh, the son or God here, when I first felt the air of Tuscany, and then when the grace was granted to me to enter the high circle in which you turn, it was in the quarter where you are. My soul now sighs devotedly to you that it may be given the power for the hard passage which is now before it. All right, enter sphere 8 out of 10. Uh, this is the first sort of uh, very supernaturally weird sphere. Uh, as you know, the first three spheres were their own category. They were those which were still marred by sin or Earth's conical shadow still uh, extended over them. That, those were the moon which was inconstant, uh, Mercury, where those who were ambitious were, as well as Venus, where those who were overly lustful or amorous were. We then had four spheres, which were outside of Earth's conical shadow, not marred by sin. We saw them each take shape. The two interlocking circles of the sun, the holy cross with Jesus in the middle of Mars, the speaking eagle of Jupiter, and the golden ladder up and down which souls, splendors were going in Saturn. And now we enter the fixed stars. Fixed stars is a, not, is a fairly prosaic, non-beautiful way of saying the constellations, uh, uh, the fixtures of stars in the heavens, and the projection of images into the heavens by us, the, uh, the sort of mental or psychological connect the dots that we do with the uh, dots in the sky, the stars, the planets that we see up there. Obviously, the medievals didn't make a strong distinction, because as you saw, they considered the sun, which is a star, uh, the same as Mars, which is a planet, uh, the same as uh, the moon, which is a satellite. They did not have quite as uh, a distinct a way of looking at the heavens as we do with access to um, electron, uh, or not electron, excuse me, uh, high-powered telescopes as we do these days. In any case, what are the sorts of people that are up here? They are called the Church Triumphant. In fact, we're going to talk to four specifically. They are Saint Peter, Saint James, Saint John, all apostles of Jesus. And then we're going to talk to someone who did not know Jesus. His name is Adam. And he is the first man from the first two stories of Genesis in the Old Testament. Genesis is, of course, a Greek name for a work that was originally written in uh, Hebrew. And Genesis means an act of beginning, um, uh, which is so interesting because there was a video game system. Maybe some of you have it, which is, is retro. Yes, very good. The Sega Genesis. And that was the beginning of a new wave of gaming with Sonic the Hedgehog, which uh, a new movie recently came out uh, two weeks ago. Perhaps you'd like to watch it. In any case... There is no liberal art in this particular spirit because we've run out of the seven liberal arts. Um, the first of the trivium we saw in the first three spheres. The next four from the quadrivium, which the medievals came up with, we saw in the next four spheres. Um, uh, but now we are sort of beyond that sort of thing. We are, we are no longer acquiring the liberal arts in this eighth sphere of heaven. We are going to examine the liberal arts. And in fact, this is a place of examination for Dante. He's going to do far less learning and far more showing what he's learned. So it's not like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday in this class. It's far more like Friday. Time to show what it is you've learned. And what is it that he will be examined on? Well, he'll be examined on the three theological virtues. And notice that I have their Latin titles there, as well as their English, as well as their Greek. Know each and every one of them. Faith, which is called fides, if you want to be a Marine. Semper Fi is a, a shortened version of Semper Fidelis, which means always faithful, like that Spanish word siempre, which obviously comes from Semper. Pistis is the Greek word for it. Uh, hope in Latin, space, very similar in Spanish. Elpis 
in Greek, and love is keratos, from which we, of course, get the word care in our language, and agape in Greek. There are four words for uh, love in Greek. You probably actually learned that from watching the Super Bowl, if you watched the Super Bowl. There was a nice commercial that talked about the four different sorts of love there, but the sort of Christian love for one's fellow man as brother is agape. Now, metaphor. The highest concepts require the sharpest minds to understand them, and we must demonstrate the sharpness of our mind. Have we been sharpened by our time in the Paradiso? Has Dante been sharpened? Uh, and he will have to demonstrate it. And like I said, the, pe the people we will speak to are St. Peter in Cantos 24 and 27, St. James in 25, St. John in 26, and Adam also in 26. Curiously, also notice that Canto 26. Canto 26 of the Inferno is where we met Ulysses, who was encased in flame, and we did not actually see or know his language. Virgil interpreted for us. Canto 26 of the Purgatorio, we met Guido Guinizelli, who was uh, uh, one of the founding members of uh, the Italian uh, style of uh, poetry that Dante uh, was a member of, uh, and on whom he would base his creation of the Still Nuo, or the Still Doce Nuova. Yes. Um, and also we met there Arno Daniel. Remember Arno, Arno Daniel got to speak in his original language of Provençal. And here we'll meet Adam, the first person ever to have used language, the creator of language and the use of language as far as Dante is concerned. And Dante will actually ask him about language and what language he spoke, which I consider that a profoundly interesting question. In any case, as we enter the fixed stars, Be Beatrice's beauty becomes more radiant. Perhaps so radiant that if she were to even crack a smile, Dante's head would explode. Dante is then content to hope. The heavens brighten, and he becomes more attentive, as if this is itself the heavens brightening, your day brightening, a metaphor for becoming curious, attentive, more aware of that which is in front of you, and more receptive to it. And I ask that question, does attention or interest brighten one's day? It certainly speeds or speeds up one's day when you pay attention to things because you're less conscious of time. And now, a beautiful quote. I saw, up above, thousands of lamps. These are lights in the sky, like stars, like angels. A sun which lit up every one of them as ours does what we see overhead. Notice that each soul illuminates itself. But mm, a sun which lit up every one of them as ours does what we see overhead. There is apparently a sun above these stars too. That sun will be called the point soon. That sun is God. That from which they der derive all their grace, all their splendor, all their light is up there. Dante is now getting his first vision of God. And as of now, God is sort of a very bright sun-like thing. Something that he cannot distinguish. Indistinguishable. Just brighter than everything which is around. Okay, cool. That's uh, very neat. Um, here you have an image of uh, Adam in the back. Notice he doesn't have a halo because he's not Christian. Uh, he was, he, nor was he Hebrew, really. Um, you see a guy with keys. That's uh, St. Peter. You see a guy who looks sort of just like... Uh, uh, Jesus, that's James, supposedly he was the brother of Jesus, and you see a guy with uh, a shepherd's crook, that's uh, most likely John, right there, the one most beloved of Jesus. Actually, if you ever look up, for some reason, uh, pictures of St. John, you all often see him, he is the most beloved of Jesus, he's supposedly the one that Jesus asked uh, to take care of his mother, which means he really trusted him, you know, even more than Peter, and you'll see for good reason. Um, but um, often he's shown as sort of having his either head on the shoulder of Jesus or on the lap of Jesus. The idea being that they were very obviously close. Very close. Okay, cool. So, uh, what's going to happen over these few cantos? Peter, in Canto 24, will test Dante on faith. Notice there that I don't say will teach Dante about faith. Uh, not that he necessarily could. I, I'm going to show you him, obviously, betray Jesus three times uh, uh, before, the, before one morning. Um, <laughs> after saying that there was no way and nothing on earth that would make him do that, we'll see that his words were uh, uh, not particularly in accord with reality. 25, we will see James taste, or taste, test Dante on hope, not teach him on hope. Dante will then define it. You'll need to know the definition that Dante gives of both faith and hope. I have it on slides uh, up here. And in 26, we will see John test Dante on love. Caritas, agape. Um, and then we'll see Adam answer four questions that Dante has for him. What are those questions? Well, these are the four questions that Dante will ask Adam, and I, I encourage you to imagine this. You are, in this case, a medieval 
Florentine Catholic Christian. You are meeting the first man ever to have existed, a man who himself walked with God, knew Eve, and fell from grace. What are the four things that you would ask this guy? Something about God, something about Eve, something about the snake, something about the tree. I mean, there are endless questions you could ask him. Why'd you call a snake a snake? How'd you come up with words? Why'd you first call things the things you called them? And what did you call them? Well, he asks questions that I would say are similar to this. These are they. When was Adam, or when was, Ad, or <laughs> the too many was is here, when Adam was created, or when was he created, and thus, how old is he? Okay, when was the first man actually created, is the question. And you'll see that it was uh, a little fewer or less than 5,000 years ago for Dante, and uh, some people that still believe that the earth is about 6,000 years old seem to use the same sort of mathematical formula. They look through the stories in the Old Testament, the New Testament, they use pretty sophisticated calculations in order to figure out uh, when the first event happened until sort of now. And some of them come up with a figure around 6,000 years. Uh, a little bit different from our new scientific formulas, but I think also uh, an interesting bit of thinking. In any case, two, how long was Adam allowed to enjoy Eden? Was he there for 10 minutes, 10 hours, 10 days, 10 years, 100 years? How long was he there? How long did it take him to disobey? The only edict he was given. We'll get an answer to that. What was the reason for God's anger? I think this is a fairly sophisticated philosophical question. Why would God be angry at his own creation? Um, obviously, if God is a perfect being, no harm can be done to him. So what is, uh, is there any crime present? Was it for a crime that Adam is punished? If, um, if a crime requires that you do harm to one party, and one of the parties cannot be harmed. Could there be a crime? And uh, four... What was the specific language which Adam made and used? Obviously, this is a very poetic question of Dante. Dante is himself a wordsmith, a poet. He cares about language and how language is used. He's learned many languages and uh, is, in fact, writing in the vulgar Tuscan dialect that will later become standard Italian rather than in Latin, which is the language of the learned at this time. He cares about language. Language is very, very deep and important to him. In fact, he makes his immortality based on language. Um, he leaves his immortal name on this poem, which is constructed of words. And so, there is here, in Canto 23, in uh, the uh, fixed stars, all the harvest gathered from the circling of the spheres. And so we're going to see more and more metaphors of gardens, of ripe fruits up here. These are not the rotten fruits of the underworld, of the inferno, the people that had an opportunity to be something robust and wonderful and yet gave up that opportunity. These are the people that lived out their choices to the max, that lived the best lives they possibly could. This is where the freshest fruits are gathered. This is like the divine, I wouldn't say marketplace, but a uh, garden. And so we see, uh, just as we saw a, a garden down in limbo of Inferno, just as we saw a terrestrial garden on the top of the mountain of Purgatory, now we will see a garden of souls at the top of the Paradiso. Beatrice speaks, here is that wisdom and that power which open the roads between heaven and earth. This is a metaphor to Peter. As you recall, Peter was given the keys to heaven, the golden one and the silver one, the golden one of power, the silver one of discernment, to open the gates of heaven so that people did not just go down to the inferno to hell after the death of uh, Jesus. He opened the gates of heaven, led Rahab in, as well as all the other uh, patriarchs, Jewish patriarchs that he was going to bring up there. And, um, and uh, then heaven was open for business. And since the time of Jesus' death, this is the account that uh, Dante accepts, heaven has been open and has been filled up, as much as it can be, with uh, the uh, fruits of good humans' labors, you might say. In any case, also notice that Dante's mind grows greater and goes out from itself. So it's like he is, again, becoming more and more one with his surroundings. And recall what his surroundings are made of, not physical matter, but more and more wisdom, grace, and uh, the three theolo theological virtues, faith, love, and hope, obviously. And so, now that his mind has grown stronger, he can now endure Beatrice's smile. He is becoming sharper. He is becoming, uh, his mind is becoming warmer and thus more capable of dealing with the fire it finds itself in. In any case, Dante then uh, gives us the ineffability topos again and says that he could not even describe Beatrice's beauty, even if he had the help of one muse, Polyhymnia. Polyhymnia is the muse of sacred poetry. Obviously, she is an important muse for this poem, as well as the uh, muse Urania, who is the muse of astronomy. This is a sacred poem about astronomy, 
essentially, those things which exist in the heavens. That's what astronomy is. Uh, but Dante says, even with the help of all the other muses, he couldn't uh, say what he has to say. And we, we recall that this is not actually new information, because he had said at the beginning of this poem that he needs not only one uh, of the peaks of Mount Parnassus, which uh, uh, would be holy to the muses, but the second peak as well, the peak that is holy to Apollo, which means he needs the light of truth, which means that he can't just use pagan sources here, he's going to have to use Christian sources here, sources that have the revealed truth access uh, accessible to them. He's not going to talk simply to pagans, he will talk to one, Adam, he's not a Christian, of course, there was no Christianity because he far preceded Jesus, um, uh, but he will talk to these three Christians, Peter, St. Peter, uh, St. James, and St. Uh, John. So, uh, also, again, uh, a harking back to a beginning. So we see that this is a new beginning in the poem. We see, again, a metaphor of, um, of uh, boats, and boats getting lost. Remember that first metaphor we got? Ooh, you should just turn your ship around, because these are going to be deep waters, and if you lose me, you might lose the thread of all these things and end up confused, like somebody in a dark wood or in a terrible uh, storm on the sea, which is perhaps even scarier. It is no channel for a little boat, that's us, that which my daring prow cuts as it goes, nor for a helmsman who is afraid of toil. So he says this, this stuff is going to be pretty hard to understand, so you're going to have to work pretty hard to understand it. So we uh, will. All right, and this is Dante and Beatrice meeting the church triumphant. You can see uh, there, there's Don, Dante, there's Beatrice, there are a bunch of triumphant people, and there's uh, St. Peter, essentially, with his funny hat, uh, looking like a pope, kind of like an angel, kind of also like Jesus, because he's holding a crucifix. All right. Now, Beatrice says, stop looking at my face. I know you think I'm pretty, and now you can see me again after Saturn, because your eyes have been strengthened by the power of this sphere. But look around. Look around at this celestial garden where all these beautiful fruits are, where all these uh, beautiful ripe souls are. Just as uh, I, I said, there's a garden at the top of Purgatorio called Terrest or Purgatorio uh, called Terrestrial Paradise. We spent uh, candles 28 to 33 or so in Purgatory there. There is a garden here. And uh, think about what a garden is. A garden is where one plants flowers and, and various plants, but flowers are the things that which are most beautiful, generally speaking. And, uh, uh, well, what happens with these flowers? Well, they, they take roots. Or they take root. And... Uh, uh, so here are the roots of the flowers. Here are uh, where we will find the causes of things. The things which are generally invisible to us on earth will become visible to us here. The roots of our garden, the causes of our, our world, the causes of our language, and the causes of how we are, are supposedly going to be answered by Dante here. These are tremendous questions. They are the biggest questions you can possibly uh, um, imagine. And Dante is taking on one of the biggest endeavors, which is to attempt to answer them in a non-heretical way. Though we don't really mind if he's heretical, we care more if he's right. All right, here is, again, notice, the rose in which the divine word, that's uh, the logos, or Jesus, was made flesh. Here are also the lilies, the scent of which indicated the way. Now remember lilies. Lilies are a funereal flower. If you're talking about lilies, you're talking about somebody who has died. So who are the people who have died, who we are, we are going to see surrounding the rose well, uh, uh, in which the divine word was put? Let's understand this. Um, the rose in which the divine word was made flesh, in this case, is Mary. She is the plant that received the seed that produced the word in life. Um, she, she is the woman that received the seed of God that then uh, partho, parthenogenetically, or parthenogenically, uh, virgin birthedly gave birth to uh, Jesus. Now, who are the lilies that surround her? They are the men who surrounded Jesus and died uh, after him. They are St. Paul, or excuse me, not St. Paul, St. Peter, St. James, and St. John. And so, notice that uh, even though this is very poetic in its description, it's very technical. It tells you exactly what's going to happen. So here is the rose in the garden from which the word of God comes. The rose is obviously Mary. We're going to see Mary. We're not actually going to get to hear from Mary, though. Uh, she's more of an actor rather than a speaker, apparently. The lilies, the funereal plant, show the examples of those dead who led the way of knowledge to him. I, I capitalize him there, meaning God or Jesus. And they are Peter, John's, or Peter James, and John, St. Peter, St. James, St. John. Okay. Now, you don't need to write this, but I'm going to say it very quickly. Dante sees the effects of these brilliances, not their causes. Interesting. 
Beatrice is then herself compared to a fair flower. Again, plant, flower, rose, garden. A new light like a circle or crown then settles around Beatrice. And the sweetest melody on earth would be like a thunderclap compared to the sound that accompanies this spirit. Who is this spirit? I circle around the womb which harbored all we wish. That means that St. Peter spends all his time in heaven circling around which character? That would be the Queen of Heaven. That would be Mary. Peter circling Mary who bore Jesus, will circle until Mary enters the prima mobile, which is itself an image of reverse birth. Uh, you'll notice with the descriptions of Mary, she's often called something like a uh, daughter of her son, which is itself a paradox, because how can you be the daughter of your son? You are the mother of your son, and yet she will often have that sort of language ascribed to her, because generally it is not the case that a mortal has uh, gives birth to a god. And, uh, and that only, there's only one time, really, in all mythology when... Uh, a, or history, depending on how you take it, uh, a human has a god for a child who then dies. I mean, even in the Greek and Roman uh, traditions, you have uh, humans born to gods that lay with mortals, but never a god born who then dies. Uh, sort of Dionysus in the past, but he, uh, he just keeps coming back. But uh, in, the, in the story of Jesus, he comes back too. So there, there are similarities, even though I wouldn't say equivalences. In any case, we will now see the border of the highest heaven. We can see the prima mobile, but it's still a little bit far away. That's the ninth circle. Um, things are going to start getting uh, very trippy up here, and we, we just need to keep going. All right, the souls sing Regina Coeli. That's Latin. It means queen of heaven. Uh, they're singing this song to uh, exalt Mary, mother of Jesus. So we have gone quite high into heaven to now see Mary, queen of heaven. Um, does Mary here represent something like a mother nature? Did she bring, uh, I, I would say Eve more represents mother nature. Uh, uh, Mary is sort of like a more positive equivalent to Eve. Whereas Eve uh, first committed original sin, it is Mary who brings about the solution to original sin, which is the man God, Jesus, who then uh, forgives original sin by dying on the cross for humanity. In the same way that Adam is like a first Christ and then he commits himself original sin and then Christ, another man, comes back and uh, writes things. And so we're going to see some interesting reversals also in these cantos. Um, let's see, let's see, let's see. Granaries and good seed mentioned, good fruits from good seeds. Just uh, another mythological correlate is that obviously as a, uh, Mary, Queen of Heaven, is uh, sort of uh, compared to a flower, she's compared to uh, agriculture, fruit. There is a queen uh, goddess of the, uh, of the Greeks who was called Demeter who obviously is compared to fruits uh, very often. The mother of Persephone, who, when she became upset when Persephone was abducted by Hades, caused winter to occur on Earth. And so there, there, are, uh, there are some, uh, uh, um, uh, not preconditions, but um, well, let's say uh, prefigurations of these characters in other religions and other peoples, but uh, they are a little bit different. Now, all on Earth are called exiles from this garden, because obviously they are not yet in heaven and not guaranteed heaven, unless they happen to be uh, Dante, and here we meet the holder of the keys to heaven, and that man is Peter, who famously denied knowing Jesus three times before the rooster crowed. All right, so I'm going to read you a couple things about Peter right here. What I want you to go into this uh, reading knowing is this. Peter is considered, his name Petrus, means rock, so he is the rock on which the church on earth was founded, which means he's supposed to be very stable and supportive. However, Peter is a human, so he uh, gives in to human nature. So the idea behind these next quotes is, this is how reliable any human is. And so I want you to really think about what's being said in this passage, about how reliable the people around you are, even your best friends and family. I, Peter, who famously denied knowing Jesus three times before the rooster Crowed identifies himself. Now let's take a look at uh, Matthew 26 here. This is uh, one of the synoptic gospel writers. This is one of the gospels from the New Testament. There are four of them. This is one of them. Peter replied, Even if all fall away on account of you, I never will. That's pretty defined language, right? Even if everybody gives up on you, Jesus, I'll never give up on you. Isn't that something that your friends say to you, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, even your mom, your dad? People say, I'll never give up on you. Ever, ever. And you're like, you're like, I believe you. I believe you because I'm young. And I know you. Because I believe in people, is what you say. It's like, okay, okay. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered. 
this very night, before the rooster crows, that means before morning even hits, you're going to be up pretty early to do this, you will disown me three times, but Peter declared, and he's going to swear, even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And so, have any of you ever had somebody really try and convince you of something and be like this? You're like, no, no, I know, you're going to do the same old thing that you always do, you're just going to eat the cookie if I leave the cookie, and they're like, no, I'm not going to eat the cookie this time, I promise! Or like, maybe even, I, just sort of a rude comparison, but like your dog, you're like, don't eat it, don't eat it, and it's like looking at you like it's not going to eat it, what's it do? It eats it. It eats it, it, eats it. it's in its nature. Yeah, sure. So, and all the other disciples said the same, so they're all like, no, 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 we'll never, never give up on you, bro. I mean, you're our bro, and you happen to be a god. We would never do that. All right, exhibit two and three. Now Peter was sitting out in the courtyard, and a servant girl came to him, and she said, you. Now Jesus is in a bad spot. And, uh, Peter believes if he is associated with Jesus, he'll get taken to jail, uh, possibly get crucified and killed. So there is something at stake here if he says that he hung out with this guy. She says, you also were with Jesus of Galilee, she said. But he denied it before them. Oh, he said, I don't know what you're talking about, he said. Then he went out to the gateway, where another servant girl saw him, and said to the fellow there, This fellow was with Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, he denied it again with an oath. I don't know the man with an oath. Meaning that he's like, you know, either gosh dang it, or, or he's like, I swear. I do not know this man. He's swearing, you know. And uh, then after a little while, those standing there went up to Peter and said, Surely you are one of them. Your accent gives you away. You're one of those Galilean people. Then he began to call down curses. Not just swearing. And he swore to them, I don't know the man. Immediately a rooster crows. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken before the rooster crows. You will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly because he was wrong. Jesus was right. This is the rock on which the foundation of the church is based. So Cantor 24, meet Peter. He's our first pope. He denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. That's a rooster. And before daylight. There's a metaphor for uh, seeing the truth slash the truth. Uh, it took him making some mistakes before he understood what it was that he had been doing. Uh, you see how that works. Uh, the name Peter, we think, comes from the Greek word petra, like the word petrify. When wood gets petrified, it becomes hard, like a rock. Like a rock. Or if you see uh, Medusa's face, you become scared, uh, and you become petrified, like a rock. Uh, the word petrified means to harden, or to become stiff when uh, uh, afraid. Uh, you, uh, you freeze up. In any case, he's also uh, the foundation of the church. The idea here being that if you put your faith in other humans, they might very well do what to you? They might betray you. That's exactly right. And so what you should do when you live in this world is, uh, is understand that even when you fully trust people, they can still betray you, which is itself a paradox. And yet, I would say, as a slightly older adult than all of you, that is definitely the truth of the world. Anybody can betray you at any time, regardless of what they say, regardless of what their history is with you, and yet you still have to get through your day in, in a way that uh, largely puts faith in people. Like, I mean, just think about it. Could you even live these days without having faith in other people? Where does your food come from? Whenever you order out, what has somebody done to your food? What have the farmers done to the food that you order and bring to your table? When you drive, do you have to rely on other people following the laws to some extent? Yes, absolutely. When you're sitting right now, do you have to rely on people not bringing like weapons or poisons to school or not coming themselves? Poisoned by the coronavirus. Yes, absolutely. Can you even live without having some base level of faith in the people around you? Even if you're the sort of person that says, I don't have any faith in people. Like, you're always showing faith in people. And yet, what must you also recognize about people? That they can betray you. That they can put their interests in front of your own. Um, even happened to a living God from one of his best friends who swore he would never do it. And it's like, what that's supposed to mean is, it can happen to who? To anybody. That's right. It can happen to anybody. Which is supposed to make you stronger in the world because when you are betrayed by someone who cares uh, about you very deeply and who you care very deeply about, it shouldn't destroy your world or your worldview. It should be something that in some way or another, in some deep, dark uh, recess of your brain, was unfortunately expected. Hmm. Now, Peter then welcomes Dan, uh, Dante to the Blessed Supper. Now, obviously, they're not eating actual physical food up here. What are they eating? Uh, the Blessed Supper of the Lamb. Uh, and remember that just kind of how uh, creepy some of the Christian mythology is there. There's a shepherd with some lambs behind him. What do you do with lambs? You lead them to the slaughter. And then you what them? Then you eat them. And it tastes really good. I had lamb last night. It's, uh, I had some gyro. It's delicious. Uh, thank you for your sacrifice, lamb. You have made me stronger. 
Well, uh, what, are, what are the lambs here? Well, these are the people that have sacrificed themselves, who have been sacrificed uh, to add to the wisdom of humanity. They have given their lives as sacrifices to embody virtues. Um, and Peter, in this case, faith, did an okay job, not great. James, hope, and uh, John, love. And so what I suggest here is sort of a, an allegorical understanding is that what they're going to be eating is what is called in the Old Testament manna, what is called in the Greek tra tradition ambrosia, but it's super substantial food. They're going to be acquiring information, ingesting information, making information part of them rather than uh, um, like actual lamb, actual meat, actual veggies. And so Peter then agrees to test Dante on faith. All right, here it goes. And right in the middle of this screen is what's most important. Peter tests Dante on faith. Um, Canto 24, lines 43 to 45, and uh, 52 to 54. Dante then prepares reasons, not simply memorized definitions. However, he will give a very useful definition that you must know in response to Peter's direct question. He says, tell me, good Christian, what is faith? Okay, Dante's being tested. What has he learned during the entirety of this poem? And this is the quote he gives. This is the quote you must have. Write this quote now. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, and the argument for what is not seen. You could ponder what that means for the entirety of your life. It, like the waters described in the sphere of Jupiter, is depthless, or has depths that human eyes cannot see down to. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So faith is in some way the essence of things that are hoped for that do not yet exist. Faith is in something that is not yet real that can be real. It is in something that is not yet present, but can be present. You believe in something that does not yet exist, so that it will someday exist. That is the idea behind faith. That is a paradoxical idea. How can you believe in something which does not yet exist, and yet, because of your belief, cause it to exist? That is a very, very bizarre question, when you really think about it. How? It sounds like magic. You believe in something that doesn't exist, in order to make it someday exist. Now, I'm not saying there's a direct causal line between your belief in existence, and the existence itself, that would be like sort of an act of God, like a divine act. However, there does seem to be some connection. I mean, just look one more time at this quote. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Something you hope for is something that does not yet exist. Something that's not yet present. I hope for my birthday to be here. It means my birthday is not here yet. I hope to someday be a great uh, uh, PhD. It means I do not yet have a PhD. Um, uh, and the argument for what is not seen. So... <laughs> You have faith in things you don't understand, in things you don't see, and in things that have not yet come about. Sort of like how you all probably have faith that you'll someday go to college, and then have a job. Maybe have a wife or a husband, and have a family. Um, and these are things that are not yet seen, and yet may someday be seen. And I, I hope for you all to essentially get what you dream for. Um, not usually so different from each other. In any case, I ask these questions uh, mostly to annoy you. What is the substance of something hoped for? I mean, that's a really odd question. That's like, what is the substance of a square you're imagining? <laughs> I, I'd probably say the imagination. And one does not know until one has achieved slash acquired what one hopes. So you don't know what the value of your faith was until you have or don't have the thing that you faithfully hoped for. Isn't that weird? Are you hearing just how bizarre these things are? But I'm saying these are supposed to be paradoxes. All right, in any case, Peter continues. Therefore, one discovers the substance of hope after one hopes for it. <laughs> Therefore, one proves the depths of one's faith or motivation through one's actions. Okay, so what is faith? Faith is, therefore, this is an attempt at a definition here, trust in the potential of the universe to become actual through human action, good or bad, better or worse. And I give you uh, lines 73 and 82 in Canto 24 as saying essentially that. Uh, whenever you do something like say you exercise, you seem to have faith in the universe that that will make health for you later on. You lift weights. Well, obviously that's painful. You're not just doing that because you enjoy it, maybe at some point, but you're doing it to get some effect. You eat some food because you hope that it's not poison, that it will help you continue to live. You work at school in the hope that you will someday be in a position to go to a university and uh, continue your studies and make much more money later on in your life. Faith is, is truly um, a belief in something which does not yet exist, but may well at some point exist. And perhaps that's the difference between bad faith and good faith. Bad faith you put in something that can never be true. I'm going to be a unicorn. I'm going to be an orca whale. It's like, perhaps in some way or another, 
but I, I don't know that that's naturally going to occur during the course of your lives. In any case, how events happen in time versus how we interpret their uh, meaning. We interpret backwards, whereas things happen in time moving forward. We have to uh, re, uh, replay events to see what was really happening. All right, all right, all right. I'm going to skip a couple of the things here. I'm just going to say these next three or four slides pretty quickly. So um, really, really keep up here. So Peter then asks, where did you receive this jewel of truth, this definition of faith? And let's look at the definition again. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the argument for what is not seen. Dante says, the downpouring of the Holy Spirit, that's the third person of the Trinity, where there's God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and the pages of the Old and New Testaments. He literally claims that he read this definition. He read it in the Old and New Testament. He read it in the Bible. The claim here seems to be that, well, what's in the Bible? The, the Bible has examples of faith, at least in this case, of people acting faithfully. And so he's saying that he understands what faith is through the examples of people demonstrating faith in this work of literature, very similar to what he's doing in literature for us. And so then Peter, I think, asks a very reasonable question. Well, why do you take the Old Testament and the New Testament as the Word of God? Why do you take that as gospel? Why do you take that as the truth? It's written. Why does it have to be honest? Dante says it was the works which followed it, not the words in it which proved its truth. It's how people behaved based on this book that justifies his faith, not the book itself. He's saying that it is the actions of people that they take by which you should judge them, not the words that they speak, which is very... Uh, I, I think very important to say to Peter because obviously he said, I'll never betray you, Jesus, and then turned around and the very same day did what? Betrayed Jesus. So should we judge Peter by his words or by his actions in this case? Actions. Obviously his actions. And then therefore the idea is how should you judge any person? By their words? I will always love you. Like Jack with... Uh, 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 the red-headed girl, uh, Kate Winslet, I believe, was her actual name, but I forget what her name was in Titanic. Uh, well, Rose, of course, yeah, red-headed Rose, I mean, it's not a very creative name. And, uh, uh, Rose and Jack, and Rose says, I'll love you forever, Jack, and then she starts another family with, uh, another man, eventually. And, uh, you know, it's like, did she love Jack forever? Maybe, maybe not. In any case, she did not let him onto the plank of wood after the Titanic sank, and then he died. So, uh, perhaps we should look at her actions. Not at her words. And, you know, y'all are getting to the age, and it is around Valentine's Day, where you start to say crazy things to each other, like, I love you forever, no matter what, or I'll be your best friend forever, no matter what. And, you know, this fills you with enthusiasm, and you love to hear this sort of thing, you probably love to say this sort of thing, you probably hope that you can keep those words. But perhaps what you will find out is that those sorts of words are very difficult to keep. And it is very difficult to love someone forever, to be their best friend forever, especially when you do not have full control over them, yourself, or the world around you. In any case, I say that uh, just to help you. And so um, that's where we have to end today. We've done quite a bit of good work, and thank you.